And now, live from Level 5 Productions on the island of Milleronia, it's The Larry Miller Show! Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America, and everyone who loves baseball. Hi, folks, and welcome back to The Larry Miller Show. I'm Larry Miller, but in a way, aren't we all? And boy, oh boy, is it ever beautiful today on Milleronia. I don't know how the weather is where you are, but folks, this is the reason to buy an outfit and populate your own island in the Pacific where you won't tell anyone where it is. It's just beautiful here. And I know technically some of you could say, well, you control the weather, though, and you can make it beautiful anytime you want. Yes, that's true. And please send your address into our website so that I can come and personally thank you for watching so closely. But you know what? It's it's true. It's just gorgeous here on Milleronia today. Makes you feel good to get up to. And that music, again, makes me feel better every week. I love it so much. And Colonel Jeff, too. And, of course, that's the Lee Bruns Orchestra and the Larissa Juarez Dancers, featuring boy tenor Mike Lucking asking the musical question, If I get my prostate exam done on Milleronia, do I get a shot of whiskey beforehand and a big book of drink coupons afterwards for being a good sport? Yes, Mike. Yes, you do. And in fact, every way you described it is exactly true. With one small difference. Our new guard for Volcano Number 2 is Ali Dunmeister Jr. He's been tossing criminals in for a long time on Milleronia. And as you know, Number 2 is the tough one. And frightened men often fight back. And that means Ali has to fight too. He can do it, though. He's perfect for it. He's six foot five and 350 pounds and has the strongest hands and fingers since his days as a fullback on the Bulgarian rugby team. And I bet you know, you know how old, tough they are. He'll get the job done, but with thick, rough, very muscular fingers. And, well, I promise you, Mike, you'll be thinking about it far longer than he will. Now, that's a source of pride for him and, and a pride, pride for you also for getting it right so, so quickly. And, uh, but the truth is just because, well, here we are on the show and the Colonel and I want uh, someone, well, loyal fans like you, Mike, to get it right and to get something you enjoy. So, entre nous, get it done on the mainland somewhere before you come out here. Because uh, we love Ollie. I mean, don't get me wrong, but he's uh, he's a monster. And you you wouldn't want him to say, Okay, turn over. Well, you might, but even saying that is a little frightening. But uh, good question, Mike. And right on the button. And by Amazon and PayPal and my book. That's right. It's once again time for me to salute the wonderful sponsors we have and to say thank you. For, uh, number one to Amazon. Boy, oh boy, folks. There's still three things Amazon does that no other company in the, in the world does. No other company can do. Number one, they get you whatever you want. They just get you whatever you want. You fill it in, you write it in, you put it in in the computer. They get it for you. Number two, they already have it. Can you believe that? They don't have to order it. They don't have to make it. They don't have to borrow it from someone. They have it right there in a warehouse that's a mile long and a mile wide and a mile high and a mile deep. And that's a pretty big warehouse. I don't care where you're from. So, you know what? Pooh, Amazon is great. And the biggest one, number three that they do, they send us here on the show a percentage of whatever it is you order. And that's pretty good news for us. They send, 
Here on to the Larry Miller Show, they send me and Colonel Jeff uh, money in cash, always cash, and we take that money and we're happy to get it. We put it right into our cash box to save for our next big fancy fried chicken dinner with two drinks beforehand in a different place. And boy, oh boy, do we look forward to that. And yes, you probably already know, we are once again thinking, might, we might just call Dr. Chris again and and invite him over for our next big fancy fried chicken dinner with two drinks beforehand in a different place. We might, but he's studying hard, as you also may know, as a clog dancing specialist at the University of Solvang which is uh, north of here and north of Santa Barbara, too. Good school, though, and top place for clog dancing. So in any case, boy, oh, boy, we love, we love them for sending that money. And to get to Amazon, you could just go yourself. But that would be the sucker's play. That would make you a moon jowl, a jabberwocky. You don't want that. So what you do is, what you do, first of all, come to us. Go to us, go to our website, which is LarryMillerPodcast.com. Who's on the mountain, Tom Mix? (laughs) That was normally the annoying cousin at any family party who has, well, some sort of little trumpet, and he, he gets to play. No, that's a fine musician, but you do that. Go to our website, and we have a banner that says Amazon right there. Click our banner, then go wash your hands and lie down on your favorite Easy Boy chair and put a magazine over your face and go to sleep. Catch a big one, and we'll get to to Amazon. Colonel Jeff and I don't care. We've done it before. We have lights on our phones that signal that either the president is calling, which hasn't happened in a long time, come to think of it. Either president, any president. But uh, you know what? It will go off, and when someone wants to go to Amazon, it wakes us up, and that red light flashes, and we get together no matter where we are on the mainland or here on Milleronia. And we'll get you to Amazon. First and flash. And there's also a PayPal banner there. That's right, a PayPal banner there, because let's be honest, PayPal is a great group. They make you think like you're sa- they make you think you're saving the world, and who knows? Sometimes with PayPal, I think you are. So if you enjoy my show, and why wouldn't you? And you'd like to send us a few bucks to help out, and why wouldn't you? You can do it through PayPal. Oh, it makes everybody happy too. And so instead of saying donate or pay what you like. Or join the Platinum Committee. I don't like things like that. I just like to say, buy us some drinks. That's right, because there are different levels. There's level one through five, all the way up to... We're driving to Florida! (laughs) Strikes me, that's that's very close to the round of applause that uh, someone gets for being tossed into a volcano. And it's not that we're mean people here on Milleronia. It's just that, well, it's a sight to see. I'll tell you that. You know how people used to gather for hangings? Well, we beat them with volcano tosses. And uh, it sounds, you know, our folks sound just about the same as that. And there is a guy, we do have a guy who who screams, yes. And uh, once we had a prisoner scream that too. As he was being tossed in, but people don't talk about that much because, frankly, it's embarrassing to the guy. He's not getting regular funeral anyway. He's not getting a, a fancy coffin. He's not. In fact, he's gone. He evaporates. Remember, you get tossed in Volcano 1, whoosh, boy, you, 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 you're you gone. The lava is so hot, you're gone. You are just evaporated. You go to 8,700 degrees in a tenth of a second. And that's pretty hot. And then suddenly you're gone. And, well, volcano number two. Holy mackerel. I mean, you know, with the tip of the hat to Ollie and all his training, volcano number two is, well, you break things on the way down and your head hits some of the ledges as you go down. 
We intentionally keep the level of lava. Oh, it's, it's, it's as hot as it could be on the way down anyway. But when you finally hit the lava, and it's got some stinky stuff in it, too. I don't know exactly what I never need to ask because I trust my volcano people. So remember, folks, if you want to get to Amazon or you want to get to PayPal, go to our website, LarryMillerPodcast.com. Who's on the mountain? Tom Mix. <laughs> That's pretty good. Well done, Colonel. And uh, you know what? We appreciate it so much. Uh, every little bit helps us keep the old leg lamp lit. And thank you to everyone who's contributed already. And thank you in advance to those of you who are just dying to do it today. And by me, signed hardcover copies of my book, Spoiled Rotten America, are now for sale at store.comedyfilmnerds.com. That's store.comedyfilmnerds.com. And, uh, well, we sure do appreciate it. In fact, I was telling Colonel Jeff, I did a show this morning that was uh, national for oh, 15 radio stations. Where you get up early, and of course that's my style anyway, <laughs> and we can do it all over. You know, it so happens I'm on Milleronia, but we use our phones, and I called the guy who organized the whole thing, the captain of the ship, so to speak, and he was in New York, and thank you, Carl, again. Boy, he puts together a great show, and every single station I spoke to, everyone in a row, because it's just one right after the other, bam, 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 bam. And you know what? They're about nine minutes each. And folks, every one of the hosts said to me, first thing, Larry, I have to tell you, I love your podcast. And he and his partner, or whoever they are, they said it at first, and they were very enthusiastic, and it made me feel terrific. And uh, we didn't send a note saying, oh, ask about the podcast. But it was great fun to talk about it. And that means you folks out there, too. Without you, it sure is true, there would be nothing better to do. I didn't even know. I thought I could rhyme that like that, but I still, I'm still not sure why. In any case, now that brings me to my favorite part of the show, the joke of the week. Yeah, boy. <laughs> nothing weak about that bongo player, by the way. You know, this is my favorite part of the show. There's nothing better than passing along a joke and to friends or loved ones or family. And folks, you know, you pass it along, too, if you like it. Colonel Jeff and I both liked this one. Uh, in a small town in America, a young boy after school hours, a young boy comes into an ice cream parlor. And uh, this fella, oh, well, the owner there, Stanley, really made a nice ice cream parlor for himself and his family and the whole town. And he loves it, and he loves doing it, and uh, he gives him a big smile. It's like an ice cream parlor in Mayberry. He sees the young boy come in, and he says, well, hello, young man. It's good to see you. I'm glad you came in. What can I do for you? And the boy says, uh, do you have any onion-flavored ice cream? And the owner well, smiles and looks a little puzzled, and he says, Well, I'm afraid not. I'm afraid I don't. But he thinks it's cute and charming that the kid asks for it. And the kid then just says, Okay, and turns around and just darts out of the store. All right, that's fine. Shrug of the shoulders. That's the way it goes. The next day, at the exact same time, in comes the same boy once again. And, well, that makes the ice cream parlor owner just smile again. Get a load of this kid. And he says, hello, young man. Hello again. It's good to see you. What can I do for you? And the kid says, do you have any onion-flavored ice cream? Just the same way as for the same thing. And the owner says, no, I'm sorry. It's not something I carry, but I, I'm glad you asked for it. And again, the kid just says, okay, and turns around and runs out. Folks, this kid comes in every day for a month. He comes in, 
asks for the same thing, and the owner just says, now the owner starts to get a tiny bit annoyed because it's the same thing every day. And uh, he just, just says, what can I do for you? Do you have any onion-flavored ice cream? No, I don't. And the kid, okay, boom, he turns around and runs out. So you know what? On the last day, it's it's the last day of the month that this kid's been coming in every day, and he goes home and uh, after work, and he says to himself, you know what? I, this may be crazy, but I wonder what onion-flavored ice cream would taste like, I, what, what, what it feels like, what it tastes like. And he said, well, that must be silly. And then he says he's at home with his wife and kids, and he says after dinner, you know what? I'm going to make some. I'm going to make it right now. And he goes to his laboratory in the basement, which he used to call the laboratory, but he goes there in the basement and he's going to make some onion flavored ice cream. He gets a big onion. Wow, a big one too. One of those with the light brown skin on it. And he cuts it off very carefully and he chops that onion up, folks, and he mixes it up and he makes some of it and then he takes a taste for himself. And well, he, he can't say he likes it, but he says to himself, I'll bet that's the best anyone can make onion-flavored ice cream anywhere on earth. And sure enough, the next day, gets up to go to work, takes the onion-flavored ice cream with him, and he says, I'll show this young man today when he asks for it. I'll just say, yes, we do, and I'll give him some and see what he thinks. Well, folks, sure enough, just after school hours, the young man comes in again, the boy, and, well, he's about nine years old or so, and uh, the owner says, Good afternoon, young man. It's good to see you again. What can I do for you today? And the little fellow says, I'd like some uh, chocolate ice cream, please. And there's a pause there. The owner says, Ch Ch Chocolate ice cream? What are you talking? Why do you want ch chocolate? You've been coming in here every day for a month asking for onion flavored ice cream. Finally, last night I went home and I made some. I made onion flavored ice cream. Why wouldn't you want onion flavored ice cream? And the boy says, It sounds terrible. <laughs> we like that joke here, and it's, it's, it's on the silly side, which is a good place to be for jokes anyway. But boy, oh boy, a small ice cream parlor in a small town. And the owner gets, well, he gets nudged into making some onion-flavored ice cream. For the record, by the way, I don't know about you, but I love ice cream and I love onions. I don't think I'd want them together, though. You wouldn't put a scoop on a hamburger with a slice of onion on it. But I think that's a pretty good joke. Boy, onion-flavored ice cream has, sounds terrible. But that's, that's our joke for the week. And that leads me to my second favorite portion of the show. The Poetry Corner. just dawned on me that maybe the reason that guy keeps coughing is he's had some onion-flavored ice cream, or he needs some. But, folks, this is a good poem. And there's something, oh, just wonderful and elegant about a good poem anyway. This is written by the great James Joyce. If you haven't read James Joyce, if you haven't read James Joyce in any of his novels, by the way, may I recommend start with Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. It's a wonderful book, but it's also easier, well, to, to get in easier to get in and get around than some of the other Joyce works like Ulysses, which, well, you need a good team of guides to get you through that one. But he's wonderful, and this is one of his poems. It's called, All Day I Hear the Noise of Waters. All day I hear the noise of waters making moan, sad as the sea bird is when going forth alone. He hears the winds cry to the waters monotone. 
The gray winds, the cold winds are blowing where I go. I hear the noise of many waters far below. All day, all night, I hear them flowing to and fro. Isn't that lovely? And it's so, well, Joycean, if that's a good word. It's, uh, whew, it's a poem that uses words that makes you think and makes you say, what in the world does that mean? And that's part of the greatness of James Joyce. I hope you like it. All Day I Hear the Noise of Waters by James Joyce. And you know what? That brings me to my third favorite part of the show. M, 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 Triple M, The Magic Movie Moment. Well, I love this section too. Boy, there's nothing like a great movie. And whether it's drama or comedy or anything in between, folks, or mixes the two, it's very meaningful to me, and I'll bet it is to you too. Colonel Jeff feels the same way. This movie is called The Naughty 90s. It's from 1945, directed by Gene Yarbrough, and it's starring Bud Abbott and Lou Costello, and so many others in a great cast, Henry Travers. Oh, it's a terrific movie, as Bud and Lou's movies are, but this one, it takes place, well, they're on a riverboat down, I guess, the Mississippi, but oh, it's so well made. And by the way, the director, Gene Yarbrough, did all their TV shows, too. He really knows what makes Bud and Lou funny. And folks, there's a whole scene in this one where they get up on the stage on the riverboat and they've been asked to perform their famous routine. This is within the movie. And they've been asked to perform Who's On First? And there are many times that's been recorded. In my opinion, this is is the best, really. It's one of the best. One of their great routines, Who's On First? They wrote it so well. It's so well staged. It's so well blocked and choreographed. It's it's unbelievable, folks, how good it is. And their rhythm, their sense of performing together is so good. And the reason this was in my head was I just saw it again a night or two ago. And uh, not from the movie, well, from the movie, Naughty 90s, but you know what? It was on the internet, and I, well, I wasn't going to miss this. How many times have I seen it? Good Lord. I mean, 30, 50, 100 times, 200 times? I, I don't even know. And as Colonel Jeff pointed out, this is one of the routines that's so well done and so classic that... Even if you've seen it a hundred times, even if you know it by heart, even if you could perform it on a stage with a friend too, you know what? You will never be bored. You will see this performed by Bud and Lou. And even if you know it by heart, you'll laugh every time you should laugh. Even when you know where the spaces are, it won't matter. You'll love it every step of the way. It's a terrific movie anyway, as their movies always are. They have, well, they have romance and they have... Oh, fear and crime in them. but And, of course, great comedy because of Bud and Lou. But you know what, folks? The Naughty 90s, directed by Gene Yarborough from 1945, has the greatest scene of who's on first in anything I've ever come across. And that is a magic movie moment to me. Please see it again. If you've seen it zillions of times, see it again and love the movie, and you'll be so happy when they walk on stage, and you'll recognize, you'll know in a second, oh, this has got to be it. This has got to be who's on first. Good Lord, when they hit those beats, they're so good together. And if you've never seen it, folks, get the naughty 90s. Drag it up on the internet somewhere, or get a copy of it in a, in a a, a DVD store. I don't even know how to name it. (laughs) But I know who's on first, and I'm glad it was in this one. And in addition to being great, there's a reason we chose it for today. And you know what? That's because today, number one, everyone you run into 
wants to talk politics. Obviously, there's a presidential election coming up where someone's crazy or both people are crazy. And you know what? I haven't talked politics. I never talk politics. I never like to talk politics because it doesn't. I mean, who does really? Who really, really, really wants to talk politics? And I, I don't know. I don't know when conversations come up in the last three weeks and four weeks, five weeks. You know, let's say you're at work and, well, yeah, there's a group of four or five of your colleagues there and they're at the water cooler and you go over to get a drink. And as soon as you walk over, you realize, wow, oh, there's talking politics. There's a guy there talking politics. That's the only phrase for it. It's such a stupid moment. He's talking politics. He's talking politics. And it dawned on me the other day, you know who the people are who talk politics? It's everyone in high school you ever hated. Now, really, they, I mean, it's everyone has gone through high school and there are some people you hate. It's not because they're mean and vicious. It's because I don't know how they do it, but they're all empty and boring and pointless. They, they spend their whole lives just trying to deal with the fact that everyone hates them. And they're right. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. I can't, can't not say that. That's a true feeling. Nobody likes these folks. I, I, you know, I'd like to, I have walked away from so many political discussions in the last month. As soon as I hear that's what's going on, I just think, oh, I can't, I can't. I don't even want to hear it. It's just so stupid. It's all so uh, idiotic and empty. And and if I, when I walk away from the conversation, as, 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 as soon as I hear that same guy's voice who was talking politics, and he, it's always empty. He said, yeah, she, he wants to do this and she wants to do that. And, I, and so I just leave. And you know what? As, as soon as I... And, and the other thing that makes me leave, once again, you're talking with a group of four or five people, and one of them is holding forth about the last debate or something. Folks, look at the faces of the other people listening. They're trapped there. Look at their faces. Don't they look nauseous? Don't they look like you? That's the way you look when you have to stand there? They don't want to be there. They... They just are. Each one of them is thinking they just can't accept the fact that in his t entire life, no one has killed this big mouth. They can't take it just as much as you can't take it. And that's what finally got me through to me. I was talking to the colonel today. I don't like talking politics. I don't want to say, oh, you like him, you like her. Ugh, it, may it makes me sick. And you know what? And... Oh, folks. And when the, uh, when the big mouth, when I finally leave, which is only after a few seconds, and the big mouth turns to you, to me, when you're leaving and says, where, where are you going? Is it me? Is it just me? I see, that's the problem with these people. They never know. But tell them the truth. Just turn and say, yes, it's you. Now, whether this big mouth is supporting Trump or Hillary, I don't care and you don't care. And, you know, you could say to them, honestly, if you could be with your candidate right now and tell them why you support them, I promise you, they would beg you to stop supporting them and go home and watch TV. Even they don't want your vote because you're too empty and boring to listen to. And the last thing they would say as you finally left was, by the way, I hated you in 10th grade and I hate you now. And I don't, I don't understand it. That's the first and only political thought I've made. And it's the only one I have that really moves me. Just stop. Go away. And you know what? If, if you find yourself lit up positively by one or more of the candidates, congratulations. Good luck to you. I, no, I don't want to hear about it. And I don't respect you for holding forth on it. But I guess that's the way it goes in that world. And now I have something far less heated and dramatic to talk about. The World Series. Yes, I know, I know, I know. It's, it's not less heated at all. And a lot of fans on both sides are not just 
ready to kill each other. They're ready to kill themselves. I, you know, I, 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 it makes me feel so sad because let me tell you the truth. I love Cleveland and Chicago. And I'm not just saying that I have worked in both cities many times and I really think the world of the people in both. Chicago is cool and fun and tough and a great place to have a steak and a lot to drink. And Cleveland is cool and fun and tough and a great place to have a steak and a lot to drink. I know it sounds like the same thing, but it is. It should be. You know, there. Because remember, in all our country, across America, there are a lot of great cities that have fine dining, whatever that means. You can put that in quotes. Fine dining. New York, San Francisco, Paris, Rome, all have fine dining. And all right, all right, but not to me. I think Chicago and Cleveland are both on that great list of cities that where you go you go there to eat a lot and you're not unhappy to eat a lot that's why you're there to eat a lot you go into great restaurants and they are great in Chicago or Cleveland and you sit there and folks and you can loosen your tie and that waiter comes over what would you like something to drink yes i would please give me a glass of whiskey with a couple of ice cubes in it and a couple of shots in it. And that means three. Because, as you know, the the motto, the theme, the backbone of the Larry Miller show is nominum quid geminus, which is something from the beginning of the show. When I, I told Colonel Jeff, and he knows the feeling, I told Jeff that, boy, every time I'm on the road and I'm fin- I've finished a job, and uh, I'm in the, going back to the hotel for the last night, and I'm going to pack and leave the next day and get up early and leave the next day. I always go to the room and, uh, well, undo the tie and wash up and call home. And then I always take my book downstairs to the hotel bar. And uh, when the, it's, it's late, it's already 1230. The bar's only open for another hour. And I always, what can you do? Uh, what would you like, sir? And I always say the same thing. Give me, uh, well, give me some Jameson's in a Jameson's glass with a couple of ice cubes and, uh, you know, get, make it a double. And folks, they never do. They put that drink. Now, that's my job is finished. And I want to see a drink set before me that's fit for a man to drink. And I've got my book, and when every time I'm telling you that the this bartender, whoever it is, in any city, puts that drink before me, it looks like a shot and a half of something in a glass that makes it look almost empty. And I've always said, now that's not the way I want a drink set before me. I want a beefy drink set before me. And I've always said to this bartender, I've you know... Uh, do me a favor, just uh, you know, f- fill that up more. Give me, I don't know how many shots you just put in that, but uh, put two more in, please, okay? And one extra ice cube, and, and then just swirl it around. You don't have to punch it or do anything else to it. And then set it down in front of me the way I want to see it. And you know, uh, you know what, but I wanted to have a more polite way of saying that. So when we started our show... I said, let's get the Latin for how you say that. Let's say it in Latin. And we asked all the folks listening, and there were a bunch of folks who sent in some different uh, comments because Latin, as you may know, is a language where you can say many different things many different ways. But there was one that was just great, nominum quid geminus, which is Latin for you call that a double? And I like that very, very much. So I'm telling you folks, Chicago and Cleveland are both cities, great cities with great people, and you never have to tell them anything like that. You never have to worry about the kind of drink you're going to get set in front of you when you order a double when you've gone out for a big steak. And you know what? That means a lot to me. In Chicago or Cleveland, 
Cleveland, you'll never have to say nominum quid geminus. You'll just look at that drink and say, and smile at the bartender and say, that's exactly what I wanted. Because the bartender, who's a smart bartender, already knows that. So never mind fine dining in cities all over the world. I don't even know what fine dining is. I've had it. I'm sure you have too. Where, you know, they, they cut the carved egg up into seven pieces and put a little green thing on it. Whatever they do is fine with me. If that's what they want to do, and then they put the signature in, you know, some kind of molasses sauce around the outside of the plate. I don't need it. I don't want it. But all right. But in Chicago and Cleveland, I know what I'm going to get. And that means a lot to me. See, all great American cities have great places just like that. Plus, Cleveland has been a star in a lot of great movies, like Major League, which is a terrific movie. Tom Berenger's Rene Russo, Charlie Sheen, Corbin Burnson, Bob Euchre, James Gleason, Randy Quaid. It's got such a great cast, and it's a wonderful story told beautifully. And you know what? They they all get what they want in the movie, and the audience loves it. I love it. That movie's going to be great for 100 years. And uh, Cleveland is also, by the way, a perfect setting for that wonderful movie, A Christmas Story, with Darren McGavin. Oh, it's just a great cast, and it's it's just so good. And Cleveland is the best place for the Parker family and their values. And that house is in Cleveland. And everyone in Cleveland is very proud of that. The house they shot that in for, of a Christmas story is right in Cleveland. And every time I perform there, the audience loves that movie and loves that house. And I always say to them on stage, don't you understand, folks? The beauty is not that that house is in Cleveland. It's that Cleveland is in that house. And I think that's absolutely true. And they're touched by that because they know it's true. And it really is that the parents, the kids, the presence, the love, it all comes from Cleveland. And it's all true, folks. The same goes for Chicago and the Blues Brothers. It's such a good movie, the Blues Brothers. It's funny and tough and really well told. But the beauty is that Chicago is in that movie. No other city would work. It lives and breathes Chicago. All you baseball fans, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. It, I know it's been a long time, and I'm with you. And I think real baseball fans are too. It, it's a great series. Yes, Cleveland won the first one, but nothing matters about any of this in baseball ex until the next game. And so you know what? Those of you who are, and I support, well, in prayer, everything anybody wants, but, you know, if you're in the stands and you've got, well, the Cleveland or the Chicago uniform on and you're a giant fan, flo folks, you know what? And they, they always see this on the, on the media. They always try to find someone. They always do find someone who's praying. I mean, got the hands together, pointed up, and the head is tipped back with the eyes closed. I, I, I appreciate that, believe me, and everything in life. But take it easy. You don't, you don't need to overshow whatever you're thinking. You know, it's been a long time, and I can't... I know, I'm with you. I'm with you. But for both teams, in both cities, with both people, and both groups of fans, and both two, well, two great stadia, it's, it's just a, a wonderful time of the year. So I'm with you. I love both your cities and both your teams very much. And I seriously wish both of you could win, but you can't. And one of you will have to go back to prayer and wait for next year. And here's the good news, though. I would, in the bottom of my heart, hug a crazy baseball fan far more than I would hug a crazy politician. And that, my friends, will never change. And I'll bet it's the same thing for you, because we know each other. And we know that. And we know that Homer is Homer and Pluto is a planet. So remember, as always, if you walked out of bed today and had a job to go to and a house to come home to and someone there who cares about you, folks, the game's over and you've won. 
And I hope you know that, and I hope you get that. Be well, and we'll see you here next time. 